boot camp. Well, uh, we're back off of a little summer break, and um, I want to use this evening as a little bit of a fall kickoff, but really also to plot a new direction for Bible boot camp. And direction is probably too strong a word. Maybe a new addition. I think there's some things we need to add to the mix this next year, uh, out of necessity, because of some events that have happened. And um, I tell you how I want to start this. I want to kind of give, and we got some new people. I want to kind of begin with the origin story of Bible boot camp. And, you know, I can look back now throughout my lifetime and I can see how things were being set up for this. So I became a believer at age 10. And that's really like end of the story for right there from 10 to all the way through college. Uh, I had little to no growth. I knew nothing about the Bible. I, um, I was a believer. I was saved and that was it. But nobody talked to me about what being a believer meant and what to do with it now. So there's no growth whatsoever. And uh, matter of fact, I went all the way through college. And then there was a random a series of events that all happened within a week that led me here to this church I'd never heard of before, Fellowship Bible Church in 1999. Got connected with some men, got connected with some organizations. It's the first time I'd heard about the Church of Irresistible Influence and I Squared and uh, the Quest for Authentic Manhood, all these things, and one other one called One to One. And to this, to this point, I had really, I never knew anything about the Bible. I went through this program here by Robert Lewis, and they actually had, they wanted to start using this as their on-ramp to all new members. So if you were coming into fellowship, they wanted you to go through this six-week course because it gave like the big picture view of the entire Christian faith. There was a week devoted to who is God. There's a week devoted to what is the Bible. There's a week devoted to Jesus. There's a week devoted to uh, the Holy Spirit. You got a big snapshot of everything. I went through this a lot. Uh, I taught this. They uh, they actually they wanted to take people through it, and so they appointed someone every little genre. So someone for senior adults and someone for uh, young married couples. I was in the singles ministry. So if you were a single guy in 2002, 2003 that came into fellowship, I took you through this. And there's no telling how many people I took through this program um, during these six weeks. And there was a secretary at fellowship. She would send me name after name and I would spend six weeks with them and multiple people per week. So I mentioned that because I got really good at teaching that. And yet I still had very little knowledge about this. So what that means is when the storms of life hit and they will hit when you don't have the word of God as your foundation, the storms blow you over. And that's exactly what happened. This was one of the high points in my life. But I was, um, just like all relationships, you, you, it's not static, they're dynamic, it kind of goes in waves, and uh, you know, if you have, uh, if your spouse goes tunnel vision and focuses on their job a lot and their career, the marriage kind of suffers. And in this case, soon after this, I was, I had a new career in my life. I was uh, becoming an entrepreneur, I was trying to start a fitness business, I wanted to open up a gym, I wanted to get on the radio, get on TV, write articles for magazines. And I accomplished all that stuff that I wanted to make money. But as you do that, guess what? This over here starts to suffer. And my relationship with the Lord kind of diminished a little bit. It dulled a little bit. And so um, all that, you know, I got away with it for a while. But then 2017 hits. And 2017 is, I'll just leave it this. You've probably all got this. The year sucked. One of the worst years of my life. Personally, professionally, relationally, spiritually, you name it, bad year. Uh, and I was, I was ill-prepared because I had no knowledge of the Bible, really, other than, hey, I'm saved and that's it. I know what to do with it. And the storm ran me over. So flash forward, it's 2018. I've been in a bit of a spiritual funk, but God was about to pull me out of it. I can see now what he was doing. Um and that sounds very, that almost sounds very arrogant. Like God was probably doing so much more that I don't realize, but I can see some of the things he was. And one of the things was <clears throat> um, early in 2018, I'm watching a uh, random podcast on YouTube. It was a Joe Rogan podcast. Purely coincidental, right? What you'll discover is there's no accidents. There's no coincidences. Coincidence is where God is working undercover. 
And this is what it was. Like one day I'm just, I just happened to click on this podcast from Joe Rogan and he's interviewing this guy about the Great Pyramid. Nothing in particular. I was just kind of listening to it. It was kind of interesting. They're talking about how, hey, we know where all these, all these pyramids, we know uh, who built all of them except for one, the Great Pyramid. And we know when all these pyramids were built except for one, the Great Pyramid. And all these other pyramids are disintegrating and deteriorating except for one, the Great Pyramid. And they're going on and on about it. And uh, I just, it was kind of a fascinating listen and they're discussing it and they're talking about how, you know, we don't have the technology today to rebuild the, the Great Pyramid. I was like, that's crazy. 700 ton blocks, 400 feet in the air. There's not a crane, crane on the planet that could do that. How did they do it? So I'm kind of listening to this and I'm kind of all in on it. Well, while I'm doing that, YouTube does what YouTube does, or maybe it wasn't YouTube, but right over here, there is a recommended video. I was watching this on pyramids and it just so happens to pop up a video on pyramids by another man, a man by the name of Chuck Missler. Never heard about this guy. I pop on, it's an audio broadcast from decades ago. And he's talking about the pyramids from a biblical standpoint. And right off the bat, you can tell this guy's a Bible teacher. And he's teaching this about the pyramids through the Bible. And I am, within three minutes, I'm hooked. And so as I watch this, here's another little video that just so happened to be recommended. And it was this video right here. His verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the book of Joshua. I had never even read the book of Joshua. And so I click and I'm listening to it. And I'm, I'm just, I'm captivated by this guy. And, and I'll, I'll spare you this just other than to say, I have never heard anybody teach the Bible like this before. He is going verse by verse. He's giving a breakdown, an explanation of every single phrase and verse. He's connected and linking it to, throughout the Bible. And I'm like, this is amazing. And something clicked and an interest and, and an excitement just snapped in me. And I started taking down notes. I started listening to it. And I go through, I mean, it was like, I don't know, 12, 15 different sessions of Joshua's. He went through chapter by chapter and I took down notes of all of it. I was just fascinated by it. I learned so much going through that, that I had never learned in my lifetime. And I was like, well, I'm going to go through other books. This guy had them all. He, he had had a 60 year ministry. He had taught, he started teaching a Monday night Bible study back in the early 60s out in uh, uh, Costa Mesa in California. And he teaches every Monday night going through the Bible verse by verse. It takes over a decade to go through the Bible that way. Once he does that, there was this new innovation at the time in the early 70s coming out called the cassette tape. So he goes back through the Bible. This time they record them on cassette tapes and he starts sending them out to the world. And you can find these audio recordings all over the Internet. It's phenomenal. It's an incredible teacher. Then as he wraps up this, it takes another couple of decades to go back through the whole Bible again, teaching it once a week, verse by verse. By this time, it's the age of the Internet. And he gets one of the first Internet sites there was, chaos.org, and uh, starts putting on video slides. And he goes back through the Bible again. The guy has 60 years of content. And so I was this year was a turning point for me. And it was setting things up. I'm going somewhere with this. But uh, I started going through each book and I would jot down notes. And I really ha I had the desire. I want to create my own Bible commentary. I want to have the Bible kind of typed out and insert like uh, commentary notes from other Bible teachers and kind of build out my own little uh, special commentary. So I'm doing this for like six, seven months. This becomes my hobby. I'm no longer binge watching, you know, Netflix and Hulu. I'm doing Chuck Missler Bible studies every night. It was so fun. And I learned so much in those six, seven months. So flash forward, it's December 2018, and I'm walking down the sidewalk. And literally, it's one of the very few God moments I've ever had. I really haven't had many. And I hear people talking about this, oh, this is a God moment. I haven't had many. This is one I had. I'm walking down the sidewalk, and in my head comes Bible boot camp. I'd never heard that before. I went home and I wrote it in my journal, Bible boot camp question mark. And I wasn't sure what to do with it. So I just kind of left it there. It just stayed there. But six more months later, 
It's now May, and I'm in this little city named Jerusalem, which is not a little city at all. And I don't know if it was being in the holy city or it was the environment or just the group I was with, but I, I realized during that week, I have learned so much in the past 12 months going through this, all these Bible studies, all these, this, this 60 years of resource by him. I want to share this with people. I don't know how. And it just dawned on me. Come on, man. You own a gym. You train people. You work in the community. Do a Bible study. Let's just do it right there within the gym. And I made, made a commitment there in Jerusalem. When I get back home, we're doing this. We're going to start it out of fast fit. And that's what happened. So, you know, look, while this was going on, it was 2019, and they'd come out with a decade of research on, you know, where the church was going. And this is one of the statistics they come up with, that they were realizing that pastors at this time were only preaching from 2 to 5% of the Bible. That's nuts, right? So most of the pastors they found were bypassing the Old Testament and only preaching from the New. So they're leaving out two thirds of the Bible. Plus, they don't want to teach on Bible prophecy because that's weird. So that's another fourth of the Bible. When you subtract two thirds plus a fourth, you get a small fraction. Basically, the Gospels and a few letters of Paul. That's it. So it's a real narrow scope. And this kind of really motivated me. It's like, OK, then I want Bible boot camp to be kind of supplementary to what people aren't getting from the church. That was the goal of mission. And a couple of verses kind of made our, I'll say our foundation is kind of like our core values. A few verses of the Bible that kind of signified who we are and, and what we're going to be. One was 1 Timothy 3, 16, which basically says this book is of extraterrestrial origin. Not the cardboard, not the print and the ink, but God's word, 1 Timothy 3, 16 says, is breathed out by God. It is engineered by the Holy Spirit through men, but but engineered by the Spirit himself. It doesn't originate here on earth. This is not the feelings of Moses or the thoughts of Paul or the opinions of Peter. No, no, no. This is the Holy Spirit. This is all scripture is inspired. The second verse was kind of Ephesians 6, 12, which means that the struggles that we're going through is not a neighbor, family member, co-worker, boss, leader, political party, Congress, Supreme Court. That's not our struggle. Our struggle is against the powers and principalities of the unseen world, the cosmic forces in this present darkness. It is spiritual warfare. So these two verses kind of, number one, that the Bible is written from outside of time and space. It predicts history in advance. It's a supernatural document. And second, that our battle is supernatural. It's a spiritual warfare. So these two verses kind of really made up, you know, who and what we are. But there was a third verse. And it was this thing that we use in just about every session. And that is the Berean principle. The fact that, you know, I didn't feel like I was a Bible teacher. I got no formal education. Uh, I've never been to seminary. I don't, I don't know how to teach the Bible. I don't have to. Because here's what happened to Paul and Silas. Neither had they. They went to Berea and they realized the people in Berea were more open-minded. They listened eagerly, but then they would go home and search the scriptures day after day. That made up kind of this, um, uh, this third pillar of what we are. That, yes, it's inspired. We're dealing with spiritual warfare. But Acts 17, 11 was basically my green light to say, I don't have to be a Bible teacher. What I need to do is present the Bible in a compelling enough way that you will go home and be excited, amp up your enthusiasm, get the juices flowing. So you go home and you read the Bible. There you go. That's my job. And by the way, we've been doing this for a couple of years. We've got probably um, uh, at our website, fasted.club backslash Bible bootcamp. You can find probably half a dozen books that we've gone through verse by verse. We've got study guides, slides, everything you need to kind of uh, get started with it. So these are the, the th three pillars. Moving forward, though, I think we need that fourth one. And I mentioned it was out of necessity because things have happened, um, not just in our society as a whole, but it's closing in on Arkansas and Little Rock. And we're going to have to start 
looking at scripture to understand what's happening in the world. The verse I'm talking about is 1 Chronicles 12, 32, which talks about another group of people who also studied the Bible, but they studied it with another purpose. It says the sons of Iskar who understood the times they were living in and knew the course Israel should take. These guys, the sons of Iskar, study the Bible. They study scripture. To them, it was the first five books of the Bible. It was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Torah, the Pentateuch. And by studying scripture and understanding the times that they were living in, they knew what the nation should do. This is what we need to start adding to this because take, take these two approaches. You have kind of a Berean approach and an Iskar approach to the Bible. And this is what, by the way, Koinonia House, uh, they have different uh, Bible study tracks you can follow. And this is two of their three. So with the Berean track, you use the Bible, and then you, you would use things like commentaries and study guides to, as supporting documents, right? Like a good study guide, commentary that helps you learn the Bible more. So that's kind of the Brian, the, the group that was open-minded, listened eagerly, and searched the scriptures day after day. Sons of Iskar, it's a little bit different path. It's using the Bible, but it's using that along with world news reports, statistics, global trends, what is happening in the world. Basically, the, sun, uh, the Issachar track is seeing the world around us through the lens of the Bible. So you've got one approach is more just learning the Bible. The other one is studying the Bible to understand what's going on in the world. Does that make sense? you got kind of two different tracks. Both of these are good, and people will lean one side or the other based on that. I want to try to marry both of these. For this next year, A, yes, be a good Berean learn the Bible, but also add this kind of Issachar element to it as we kind of learn the Bible, but also see what's happening in our day and age, because this is what I want for this next year. I want us to understand what time it is. Most pastors don't know what time it is, and because of that, their church doesn't know what time it is. And let me show you. This is what we're going to do tonight. Um, and this is probably going to scare half of you off. This is probably the worst way to grow a Bible study is what I'm going to do. But, um, you know, it's not about me growing. Uh, you know, I, I, need, I need to shock you just a little bit to get you to fully understand what's going on because you're not going to hear this in the church. Speaking of church, U.S. church membership falls below majority for the first time. Fewer people are going to church now in America than at any point in time in our country's history. And when you look at this generationally, the oldest generation has the highest rate of church activity involvement, and it falls with every single generation to the point that Gen Z, the youngest generation, it is a fraction of them that are involved in church. Gets worse. Only 9% of self-identified Christians hold the biblical worldview. Less than 1 in 10 believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. This next statistic might explain why that is. That's the congregation, right? 9% of people who profess to be Christians think that uh, hold a biblical worldview. 37% of pastors have a biblical worldview. When they interview these pastors and they really ask them about the Bible and scripture, is it the inner word of God? It is a diminishing, uh, sad statistic and really uh, quite a commentary on how far we've fallen. We're just a few centuries away from one nation under God. The church is in decline. Christian values is in decline. Belief in the Bible is in decline. And even our uh, pastors and leaders diminishing. So the question is, in a, in a country that has a diminished church and a diminished faith, what happens? What's the byproduct? What happens as a side effect of a diminished church society? Well, I'll show you. So I wasn't going to do this because this is this is a little bit shocking. But I'm going to say that the rainbow jihad, as I call it, is coming for your kids. There is a rival religion that is growing. And I want you to see this because this is what we're going to be up against. This is something that's, that's not going to be on the coast this is going to be in our own backyard. 
Check what happened out. while we were away brought to you by Happy Visitation Rights and Tax Benefits of Traditional Marriages Month. We could crack Lindsey Graham jokes or discuss how there are seven colors in the rainbow but only six in the rainbow flag, but instead... We're commemorating the month our culture overtly dedicates to one of the seven deadly sins by shining the spotlight on the true reason for the season. Sexualizing kids. Yesterday, libs of TikTok on Twitter put together a mega thread pinpointing how drag is being targeted at kids. And it goes like this. Just in May, a gay nightclub in Minnesota held a drag show for children seen here. One of the performers said in an interview, quote, I want to give the kids an opportunity to see what drag queen king life is like on a day to day basis. A preschool in Massachusetts is hosting a pride event, including drag queen story time and a pride parade. A bar in Dallas, Texas, is advertising a drag show for kids, including the opportunity for some of them to perform with the drag queens on stage. This is the drag queen host. A library in Bristol, United Kingdom is advertising a drag queen story hour tour where drag queens will be touring that country reading to children. The Alameda County Library in California is advertising a drag queen story hour specifically targeted at preschoolers. At something called DragCon in Los Angeles, children danced on stage with drag queens and even collected money. In Pennsylvania, a teacher hosted a drag show event for students. Parents were not notified. The district there confirmed the teacher is on leave. In Arizona, a school counselor arranged a drag show for students and was later arrested for having sex with a student. In Jasper, Indiana, a pride event with a drag performance is being advertised for all ages and they're encouraging kids to bring cash to tip the drag queens. In Ontario, a youth pride organization organized a drag queen story hour tour at various public libraries for all ages. In Weston, Vermont, a public library had a drag queen story hour for all all ages with stories focused on gender and activism. They write, quote, Drag Queen Story Hour captures the imagination and play of the gender fluidity of childhood. Libraries in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Chicago, Amesbury, Massachusetts, and Davenport, Iowa are all holding drag queen events for kids. All of those libraries are publicly funded. A Philadelphia school invited a drag queen to perform for students and it's Still on the schedule for later this week. The administration for Ankeny High School in Iowa claimed they had no idea a drag event was scheduled where this guy performed for students. There's apparently an investigation into the matter. K-12 schools in New York City have partnered with various drag organizations to bring drag queens to schools to read to kids. A church in Florida recently had their plans exposed to host a drag queen show for kids. A school in Wisconsin this year treated students to a drag performance. In Warrensburg, Missouri, the Pride Festival there is advertising a drag show for all ages. Sponsors include a local bank, medical clinic, and PBS. Drag shows for kids are also being advertised in Maui, New Jersey, Apex, North Carolina, Manchester, Vermont, and Denver, Colorado. So there's over 20 examples of blessings of liberty from sea to shining sea and elsewhere in the woke West. And that's not even the totality of the thread put together by libs of TikTok on Twitter. Now, when you see that, did you notice where this was happening at? Not New York, California, um, Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, states all around us. And I knew when I saw that in June, it's coming to Arkansas at some point in time. We're not going to escape this. So I tried to keep a watchful eye. And um, I think it was the 1st of August that the Fayetteville Public Library was going to put on a back to school function. And they um, they were going to have a meet the teacher. You can get your school supplies. And by the way, you can do gender transition uh, meetings. You can learn if you're a uh, eight year old boy and you want to become a girl, how do you go about changing your name? Uh, they were also going to have a drag queen story hour that evening where and uh, kids are in, you know encouraged to tip the drag queens. It got shut down. Thankfully, um, someone put an end to it. But I was like, wow, you know, so the enemy suffered a loss. Now, Team Lucifer, when they lose a game like that, do they just sit back and be like, OK, well, we give up. No, no, they come even harder. And matter of fact, they're coming. They're coming for Arkansas, and they're coming this month. This is the Facebook page for Drag Queen Story Hour Little Rock Chapter. You didn't know they had a Little Rock Chapter. Well, they do. And here's what's going on on September 24th. 
Drag Queen Story Hour is just what it sounds like. It's using the art of drag to read books to kids. I mean, why would you not want to read books to kids, right? In spaces like this, kids are able to see people who defy rigid gender restrictions, i.e. going against how God made them. And they get to imagine a world where everyone can be their authentic selves. Let me just translate that. I can be my own God. If I don't like the gender that God made me, I can just be my own God. I can make my own decision. This event, by the way, is a family-friendly event. I've looked at some of these drag queen store hours. They're in just about every major city. They have their own chapter. They have their own movement, and it's growing. They all use that same phrase, family-friendly event. And I almost laughed. as like, since when does dudes in thongs twerking before toddlers become family friendly. And I'm seriously asking that. This is new to me. Like I was six, six months ago, a year ago, I wasn't even aware of this stuff. It just kind of come up to me. Since we are so excited to bring Drag Queen Story Hour to Little Rock, please come to this colorful and royal event with the newly crowned Miss Gay Arkansas America Savvy Savant and his royal court. There you go. So that's happening. And uh, of course, here he is and I'm just trying to make the world a little brighter to, to the toddler. Uh, so this is growing. I wish that this is where, it's, where it ended. Like th th this is as bad as it gets. Drag queen story hour to toddlers. Uh, but it's not. Here's Boston Children's Hospital. Watched an interview from um, a lady that works there. And I tell you, it was, uh, it was tough to watch, tough to listen to her. She was so happy to be able to help children. But they have a center for gender surgery. And um, here's what they say. They're pushing the boundaries of what's possible in children's death. And boy, are they pushing the boundaries. By the way, this hospital is one of the most reputable hospitals in the nation. Here's what's on their website, though. It says, you may be aware that, across, uh, that in states across the country, there is a recent increase in proposed legislation aiming to restrict the rights of transgender and gender diverse youth. Legislation to restrict the rights of transgender. Okay, keep that in mind. Many of these bills aim to restrict access to medical care and limit children and adolescents who identify as gender diverse from participation in sports. So this legislation is preventing boys from dressing in the girls' dressing room, from taking a spot on the girls' basketball team and the girls' swim team. That's what this is. That's preventing it. Boston Children's Hospital has always been and always will be committed to providing the best care for all of our patients, regardless of their gender identity. The belief that all children deserve the opportunity to live, grow, and thrive with love and support is foundational to who we are and what we do. It sounds great. It sounds like they really love kids. And it goes on and on and on. Um, let me just sum this up and give you a perspective of what they're doing. Here's how they love children. So an eight-year-old boy decides in a moment he wants to become a girl. Um, Boston Children's Hospital will help them. First thing they do is they castrate the young boy, and then they will take the skin of the penis, and they will create a fake vagina. It's a surgery that goes all the way up into the pelvis, um, and he will have to spend the rest of his life um, weakly lubricating himself because he can't self-lubricate and he'll be irreversibly changed. That's part of the surgery. They're also performing breast removal surgery for 12 and 13, 14 year old girls who decide they want to be a boy. And it goes on and on. Do a Google search on it. You're going to be appalled at some of the stuff. I'm taming it down. I'm actually giving you the, the, the tame version of this. Because it, uh, it, it is sad and depressing to me. My heart goes out to these kids, and I have this anger towards people like this woman who smiled and says, we will let any eight-year-old boy be anything he wants, and also the parents. So this is going on. Now, this is in Boston. You know, it's kind of a – you can kind of see that happening there. Surely not in Arkansas, right? Huh. This just recently popped up on Arkansas Children's Hospital, uh, their website. This is Arkansas Children's provide services to, to youth with gender dysphoria due to gender incongruence using a gender affirming model of care and individualized treatment plans developed for each patient. I'm not sure what that means. 
I hope they're not following the path of other uh, hospitals, but something tells me they might. So we've got Drag Queen Story Hour coming for the kids. We've got transgender surgery to eight-year-olds also coming for the kids. Where's this going? What's the next step? Now, all of this is under what I call the rainbow jihad. It's all the same. This is what I believe is America's new religion. They have their own symbol. They have their own doctrine. They have their own belief system. They have their own devoted followers. They are. They will fight tooth and nail for their belief system and their doctrine just as much as Christians will. This group, however, though, is about to have the full power of the federal government behind it because they're going to be able to weaponize everything to fight against what I think is the rival religion. Christianity and the rainbow jihad is is um, about to clash. Now, let's look at this right here. Where, where's the trend going? You've got this whole thing, whether it's gay, transgender, everything, this LGBTQ. When you look at it from a generation standpoint, the silent generation is only 0.8%. But with boomers, it more than doubles. And with Gen Xers, it doubles again. You'll find that it's doubling every generation. When you get to millennials, it doubles again. When you get to Gen Z, it doubles again. Where is this going? Well, I think you can see where it's going. And if this carries on, I mean, it's not too long from now as it doubles every generation. We're going to be Sodom and Gomorrah, 100 percent. So how do we stop the trend? How do we stop that? It's simple. It's what I've been talking about. It's revival or bust. We have to bend the knee and have and pray for revival. Uh, but I'm going to get into some what I think we should be doing. So this is the uh, the pride rainbow. Notice it has six colors, six colors of the pride rainbow, where God's rainbow has seven. But okay, so you've got um, you, you've got this growing movement. You got transgender surgery. Maybe that's as far as it goes, right? No, the enemy doesn't let up, and he's coming for the kids. I mentioned about six months ago. Uh, the, the next letter that's going to be added on to the LGBTQ is going to be the letter P, pedophilia. That's the next logical step. They're coming for the kids this way. Check out Google. It's called now Minor Attractive Persons or MAPS. It's a neglected population. And we are vilifying people that are pedophiles. Really, they're just suffering from a minor attraction. They're attracted to minors. Meet Miranda. Miranda is a licensed counselor specializing in sex education, and she believes that we have to start treating pedophiles much differently. We need to show tolerance and acceptance for who they are. Meet Dr. Alan Walker. Might be confusing, but yet, despite the haircut, Dr. Alan Walker is a woman, and uh, she is a professor, I think, at Virginia. She wrote the book, A Long Dark Shadow, Minor Attractive People and Their Pursuit of Dignity. Let that sink in. Here's part of the book. It says, to those who accept themselves, to those who are working on it, and to those who accept others even when it's hard. The whole premise behind what she teaches is that um, we need to show more tolerance and acceptance and love to people who are suffering from minor attraction. Is having an attraction to uh, to a minor as long as it is an active one doesn't mean that person who has those attractions is doing something wrong. A lot of people, even when they heard the term pedophile, they automatically assume that it means a sex offender, and that just isn't true. It leads to lots of misconceptions about attraction towards minors. So all this is the same. I mean, from you know, even right now, our country is voting on this week same sex marriage. And whether it's same-sex marriage or drag queen story hour or the LGBTQ community or transgender surgery, it's all the same and put pedophilia in the same thing. They're coming after the kids. But ultimately, here's what's happening. This is all about to become federal law. Everything, I, I, I believe even at some point in time, pedophilia. This will all be weaponized against the church. That's what this has always been about. I used to think that it was about um, same-sex marriage. It was about kind of dismantling the family. 
No, it's not about marriage. We fought that 10 years ago. This is about weaponizing it against the church. Why is that? Do you know that in America right now, 80%, 80, 80 of all the global missions that go out to the world, 80% is right here in America. Boy, don't you wish that, I mean, don't you think the enemy would love to take out that? I think he will. I think I think that's I think that's his plan. Um, now the church will go on. Even the gates of hell won't prevail against my church. So we know that's true. But I don't know about America. There's no guarantee there. But this is all being weaponized against the church, and, and I believe that's that's where we're headed. So just some thoughts here. I want you to this week read Romans chapter one. It is the ultimate, it's the pinnacle of Paul's writing, the whole book of Romans. Romans 1 is the litmus test. You want to find out where your church is? What's their opinion of Romans chapter 1? Do they even teach it? Most churches skip Romans like they skip Leviticus in the Old Testament. Romans chapter 1 is your litmus test to determine, does your pastor and does your church know what time it is? Because you, you, can't, you can't get around it. It's up in your face. It is Paul bringing the heat. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff coming. And all this stuff that I brought here, I mean, I know it's a little bit shocking. I get that. But it's it's coming to our neighborhood. Drag Queen Story Hour is coming. Maybe it's downtown this month. But next month, it's going to be at your local library. And then it's going to be down the street from you. What happens when it's down the street from the church? What happens when it's in the church parking lot? What happens when they want to perform in a church? Uh, at what point in time do we stop and say no? That's the question. The church has set down, and men in particular, we've set back and we've let the enemy run us over. When the, 60 years ago, when they said, you know what? Hmm. We're outlawing the Bible from the, the public schools. We said, okay, go ahead. And they said, and then the next year, hey, we're going we're gonna to strip a prayer out of public schools. Okay, go ahead. And then you know what? We're going to take down all the Ten Commandments out of every uh, courtroom. Okay, go ahead. Oh, we're going to destroy marriage also. Go ahead. So the church has been attacked for 60 years, and we have sat back and said, go ahead. Do what you want to with us because we want to be peaceful. And um, I'm not calling for violence here, but at some point in time, we have to stand up and say no. Let me give you an example of something. There was a monk by the name of Telemachus, and Telemachus was a devoted believer, and he was living in the Roman Empire, and he wanted to go visit Rome. He wanted to go visit the capital city, and so one day he, he, he travels to Rome, and he's seeing the architecture, and this is the pinnacle, the capital of the world at the time. And he's just, he's just, he's amazed by the structures and the buildings. But he notices all the people are centered in one place, the Colosseum. So he goes to the Colosseum and he, he walks up and there's thousands and thousands of people in the Colosseum. And they're yelling and yelling and yelling. And so he watches and what he sees is the gladiator fights. And it's two men with swords fighting literally to the death. And when one would get one in a compromising position, he would pause and wait for the crowd to either spare his life or kill him. And the crowd would yell, finish him. And he would. And Telemachus is watching this and he, he can't believe it. Uh, it. This is the most horrific thing he's seen. And he, in a, in a moment of inspiration, he walks down the steps of the Colosseum and he walks out onto the Colosseum field. And in front of these thousands of people in Latin, begins yelling, in the name of Christ, stop this. And he repeats it. And the people at first, they think it's part of the show and they're laughing. But soon they realize that he's serious as he keeps repeating in the name of Christ, stop this. So finally, they get upset with him. They're throwing things at him. And one of the gladiators takes the spear and runs it through him. 
And Telemachus, as he's laying there, bleeding out, dying, says one more time, in the name of Christ, stop this. And Telemachus died there, right on the Colosseum field. Probably not how he thought that day was going to end. But you know what else what happened? That was the final day of the gladiator fights. It came to an end that day. Because as word got out about Telemachus and what he did, the church, the believers in the community rose up, inspired by his sacrifice. And they are the ones that took the stand and said, in the name of Christ, stop this. And they did. The church stood up against the empire, the most powerful empire. So I look at all this, this drag queen story hour and transgender surgeries on eight-year-old boys and girls, pedophilia. This is all coming. The church has set back for 60 years. We've been very peaceful. Please don't strip us of our 501c3. Uh, you know, we just want to, we would just want to get along. At what point in time do we confront, take a stand like Telemachus and say, no, in the name of Christ, stop this. I want you to think about that this week. I want you to read Romans chapter 1. And until then, Romans 8.28.